Yeah, my name is Dr. Shrini Iyengar from Boulder Community Health of Boulder, Colorado. You guys, want to go ahead and introduce yourselves? Sure. Um, I'm Andrew Rassi, uh, interventional cardiologist at Kaiser Permanente in San Francisco. And uh, Mark Ricciardi, uh, Northwestern Chicago. All right, guys. So, do you first presentation? I see Uktesh uh, Bedi. I wasn't sure if Dr. Qureshi is going to present. Want to go ahead and go start with the presentation? Go ahead. Come on up. All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Gazan Fakureshi. I was an advanced interventional fellow at the uh, University Hospitals in Cleveland. Uh, today I'm gonna present you a very interesting double valve intervention case. Um, and the objective uh, of this case to, is to highlight the importance of the comprehensive pre-procedure planning uh, to utilize the CT in a complex double valve intervention to individualize or customize the treatment for extremely high risk patients. Um, as we know that you know, we see very interesting cases, beautiful results that we, we get from these structural uh, procedures, but there's a lot of work is behind the scene, uh, which is considered to be a pre-procedure planning. Uh, to get to these you know, beautiful results and pristine results, we have to have a good planning uh, to execute. And this case is, is a perfect example of that. Uh, briefly, the history is, uh, this is an 89-year-old, uh, very frail um, lady with previous history of tricuspid valve repair. Um, she had a maze procedure and a bioprosthetic mitral valve replacement with a Carpentier 29 valve. Uh, she's been having a lot of uh, recent uh, uh, hospital admission for the decompensated heart failure. And uh, she was also found to ha have a severe aortic stenosis along with the structural deterioration of the uh, bioprosthetic valve as suggested by the severe regurgitation. Um, so her, um, her STS score was high, um, more than 10. Um, so these are the images showing uh, to confirm the aortic stenosis, very high gradients, aortic valve area of 0.65, uh, mean gradient of 33 with preserved ejection fraction. And uh, the mitral valve assessment showed, uh, as I said, uh, severe deterioration of the bioprosthetic valve with the eccentric uh, mitral valve regurgitation. So at this moment, uh, uh, having a two valves uh, malfunctioning, uh, what would be you guys uh, do at this moment? What would be your approach? This patient should go back to the surgery, have a double valve you know, replacement, or would you prefer to have a transcatheter approach? Any suggestions? Yeah. All right, so that's what we plan. So this is a high-risk patient, 89-year-old, STS high, um, double valve. So we decided to go with a transcatheter approach. Okay. All right, so for the transcatheter approach, we always do the CT, right? So that's a CT uh, pre-procedure planning. And the CT, we always look for the um, axis evaluation, tortuosity, uh, anatomy of the valve, and you know the, uh, the valve sizing, all those information. But at the same time, the CD is a critical in evaluating further information that it can provide. And as you can see in this image, um, anybody can, uh, can tell me what is the problem with this CD image? What's going on in this one? So this patient had a bioprosthetic valve, right? Mitral bioprosthetic valve. So here you can see so this is a strut that is protruding into the LVOT. <coughs> and it's, and it, this is the 3D recon image where you can see this is the annulus, this yellow line is the annulus, uh, aortic valve annulus, and uh, this is the, the white is the, the protruding uh, bioprosthetic uh, mitral valve strut. And as you can see, the measurements, it is very uh, close to the um, aortic valve annulus, uh, 2.1 millimeter, and 6.8, and the distance from the tip to the septum is barely 3.9 millimeter. So having this kind of anatomy and this complexity, any change in the plans? Would you go for the surgery or is still persistent with that transcatheter approach? Yeah, why don't you tell us, why don't you go on and talk right. about So um, in this kind of situation, there is a third approach. It's called the hybrid approach. So which is basically 
Um, it's a comprehensive discussion between the interventional cardiologist and the surgeon, and uh, we decided that we're going to remove that strut that is obstructing in the LVOT along with the leaflet removal. So, um, and then we're going to have the transcatheter mitral valve in valve and at the same time surgical aortic valve replacement. So the goal for this hybrid approach, um, which is a non-conventional approach, is to minimize the time on pump that is very high risk patient would need for the double surgical valve replacement while minimizing the possibility of the catastrophic complication of the LBOT obstruction after mitral valve and valve. As we know that there's a 20 to 30% risk of uh, LBOT obstruction after the TMVR valve and valve. So we proceeded with the, uh, uh, with the surgery and the surgeon removed that, uh, identified that strut which is obstructing in the LVOT and he removed the, uh, the leaflets. Uh, at that moment, we deployed the Edward Sapien um, uh, through the direct visualization through the uh, left atrium uh, at the mitral valve position. And then after that, the surgeon uh, deployed the, uh, uh, the surgical valve at the aortic valve position. And these are the images taken uh, during the OR. And uh, as you can see in, the, in this panel, this arrow indicates that strut which is, you can see from the aortic side, after the removal, and you can see clearly there is no strut, and then this is the Edward Sapien valve at the mitral valve position. And the, this is the intra-op T, you can see uh, beautiful results with the uh, transcatheter mitral valve and valve uh, with no regurgitation. And this is the Saver aortic valve uh, replacement. Again, beautiful results. Uh, with no uh, PVL. This is the post-op echo, uh, transthoracic echo showing no LVOT obstruction with a mean gradient of only six. So the take home point from this case is to emphasize the utmost importance of the detailed CT pre-procedure planning uh, in this transcatheter valve therapies, which enabled us to customize hybrid approach in this very complex scenario. The two treatments, modalities, surgical and transcatheter, can be utilized together to deliver pristine patient care while preventing potential post-procedure catastrophic complications. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And due to time, guys, we'll actually hold off questions if unless there's anything pending at this point. So we'll bring on the next speaker. All right, guys, is it Dr. Qureshi? Okay. I think it was Dr. Qureshi right here. Oh, Qureshi was working. Hi, my name is uh, Uptesh Bedi. I'm an interventional cardiologist okay. from St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, nothing to disclose. So we are going to talk about uh, a procedure which we, as adult interventional cardiologists, perform very rarely. It's a pulmonary valvulotomy. And this is a 25-year-old female who was uh, recently immigrated from the US to, uh, from Somalia. Uh, she had been uh, experiencing worsening dyspnea on exertion for the past few years, and now it was limited to walking up to 10 feet. And then she had to stop because of this. On physical examination, there was a palpable thrill in the left subclavian area, loud systolic murmur heard loudest in the pulmonary area. Um, an echocardiogram was performed to further evaluate this, and we saw that the LV size was fine, but the RV size had moderate dilatation. There was RV hypertrophy. RV function was mild to moderately depressed, mild tricuspid regurgitation, and severe pulmonary valve stenosis with a pulmonary valve peak gradient of 87 millimeters of mercury and a mean gradient of 45 millimeters of mercury. Uh, this is the echocardiogram which shows the pulmonary stenosis uh, and you see the increased gradients across that. Uh, this is a cardiac MRI which was performed and we can see uh, the pulmonary valve right here. I don't know how to show the, right there. See the pulmonary valve and you can see the increased turbulence of flow. You also see dilatation of the main pulmonary artery and then you see the dome-shaped characteristic of the, of the pulmonary stenosis. And we'll go over the various reasons for pulmonary stenosis after this. Uh, this decision was made to go ahead and do a pulmonary uh, valvotomy on her and uh, she was brought to the cardiac catheterization laboratory. This is gradients across the pulmonary valve, and you can see significantly increased gradients across the pulmonary valve. Um, 
So to do the pulmonary valvotomy, first a pigtail was placed into the right ventricle and a RV gram was obtained. The RV gram demonstrates, as we can see, right ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, pulmonary valve is right here and then there is dilatation of the mean pulmonary artery. This is performed prior to do this so that you know you can see where the pulmonary valve is so it can help you guide your valvotomy. After that, uh, we used a balloon-tipped catheter to go into the pulmonary artery and the reason uh, it's important to use a balloon tip catheter rather than say a JR4 is that you want to make sure that you're not crossing through the tricuspid valve apparatus because if you later on take the balloon up, your z balloon up through the tricuspid valve apparatus, you can injure the tricuspid valve on the way back and that can be pretty bad. Um, in this case, we used um, 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 a wedge catheter which has a 035 wire lumen. So once we had that uh, placed through the pulmonary valve, we exchanged it for a stiff amplex wire. And through the stiff amplex wire, you can also see a pacemaker here, which was placed for rapid RV pacing during the thing so that the balloon doesn't uh, uh, doesn't embolize during water balance during this. Uh, the next step is doing the pulmonary valvotomy. We did the rapid pacing of the RV. And then after that, the balloon was, this is a, a 20 millimeter balloon which was used and the sizing generally is recommended that is based on the annulus of the pulmonary artery. So the pulmonary valve annulus in her case was 16 millimeters and we chose a ratio of 1.2 uh, of balloon to pulmonary valve annulus ratio of 1.2 and hence we chose a 20 and you can see the waist right here. Um, as we do that rapid pacing and then the pulmonary valve. We did two balloon inflations and after that we demonstrated that you know the, the valve gradients had decreased from a peak gradient of 87 um, and a mean gradient of uh, uh, to a, from and a mean gradient of 45 to a mean gradient of 26 and a peak to peak gradient of 37 millimeters of mercury after the valvotomy after two uh, two balloon inflations. And we performed the RV gram after that, and this was also uh, measured with echocardiogram, the gradients after this. Um, if you look at the pulmonary valve stenosis, you can see the pulmonary valve anatomy. It's a three uh, tricuspid valve. Uh, there are two reasons for pulmonary valve stenosis which occur. One is the congenital isolated pulmonary stenosis where you see the typical dome-shaped appearance of the valve. 80%, 80 to 90% of cases are like this. And the other thing is a dysplastic pulmonary valve which occurs in 10 to 20% of cases. The reason it's important to know is because for this one, for the isolated pulmonary, you would use a balloon to uh, annulus ratio of 1.2, whereas with a dysplastic pulmonary valve, you would use a, a balloon to, uh, you'd need a higher, uh, bigger balloon. So a balloon to annulus ratio of 1.4 uh, is generally found to be more effective in these cases. Um, physiological impact of pulmonary stenosis, we all know that, you know, it will cause RV strain and hypertrophy of that. Uh, but along with hypertrophy of the RV, it causes hypertrophy of the infantibular outflow tract, which is one of the common reasons for increased gradient sometimes even after pulmonary valvotomy, and that needs to be recognized. Um, when do you treat pulmonary valve stenosis? It's, it's basically three grades. Mild is a peak gradient of less than 40, moderate is 40 to 60, and severe is more than 60. Decision to do a pulmonary lobotomy is based on the gradients. If it's an asymptomatic patient, then a peak instantaneous Doppler gradient greater than 60 or a mean gradient greater than 40 millimeters. And if it's a symptomatic patient, then a peak instantaneous gradient more than 50 or a mean gradient more than 30 millimeters of mercury is, is recommended. Uh, balloon sizing, like I said, balloon to annulus ratio 1.2 to 1.4. Smaller balloons have a higher chance of restenosis, and larger balloons can cause injury and, and increase pulmonary regurgitation, which you need to walk, watch for. Uh, it's a pretty safe procedure. Mortality is 0.24%, major complications 0.35%. Hypotension and bradycardia are generally uh, transient. Post pulmonary valvuloplasty, uh, infundibular obstruction can occur, which is treated with beta blockers. Um, complete heart block, rupture of tricuspid valve, papillary muscle, uh, pulmonary artery uh, tear, and the main thing that you have to watch out post uh, is for echo follow up is pulmonary valve regurgitation. Um, the, regarding this patient, we had a two year follow up uh, now, and she's had rapid improvement of symptoms after this. She was able to uh, uh, actually. Uh, be a part of the workforce now before that she was on disability and she's been doing really great. And the repeat echo has shown uh, no worsening of pulmonary valve gradients or development of pulmonary regurgitation at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, why don't you have questions? We do have time for questions. I have one for you. So yes. the, how did you do your sizing? So it's based on the analysis of the... But what imaging modality did you 
Uh, so we use both the MRI. We had a cardiac MRI in her case, but you can use an echocardiogram also. Yeah. You use mostly the MRI. I use mostly the MRI in this case because we had the MRI, so sure. it was very good. But uh, the echocardiogram, we kind of confirmed it with the echocardiogram. What the echocardiogram. Uh, so she had a 16 millimeter analyst. I used a 20 millimeter ZMED. You can also use a new med, which has a nice waist, but we don't carry that in our hospital. Shack, you guys aren't using that we don't have the tie shack on our shelves. So. And then the suicide ventricle, did you pre-treat her with beta blockers? Uh, I did put her on beta blockers before. She did not develop a suicide ventricle, but I did have a small drip on standby. Because that is one of the complications which can occur, is that the RV can just stop immediately. And then the counterintuitive thing is to kind of treat it with, uh, with a small drip. We did have it on that standby. Did not have to use it in her. Good. Yeah. yeah. Good job. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, so our next speaker is um, Jonathan Schwartz. And the case is, it says, Hail Mary, the emergency Yeah. All right, thank you to the meeting organizers for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I thought this would be an interesting case just because it's a, a case where there seemingly are no good options, but we, as you'll see, I guess I won't give it away, but you'll see what happens. So, uh, Hail Mary, pseudo aneurysm closure, I have nothing to disclose. We'll just get right into the case, given only have five minutes. Uh, it's a 78 year old woman with a very complex history. We'll spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, initially, in the distant past, had severe AS with an ascending aortic aneurysm, ended up getting a surgical aortic valve with a 21 millimeter magna bioprosthesis, as well as an aneurysm repair that was primarily just a resection. They didn't have to put a graft in. Uh, that was back in October. Also has AFib on warfarin with a prior stroke and a DVT and a PE while on warfarin, so her INR goal was a little, uh, elevated a little bit beyond the usual two to three. One month post-op after that surgical aortic valve, she presented with an acute type A aortic dissection and ended up needing emergent surgery with a 30 millimeter hemishield graft uh, via a circulatory arrest and ended up undergoing a hemiarch replacement. Interop, they found a one centimeter tear adjacent to the aorto aortotomy suture line in the right anterior ascending aorta. That's important later. Two months post-op then presented again with some fevers, ended up having a chest wall abscess mediastinitis and ended up requiring wound debridement and had a wound vac placement, was on IV antibiotics at home for a while, but seemingly was doing okay uh, until about five months later, so this is back in the spring now, presenting to an outside facility with some chest pain. A CT was done out there uh, with maybe it wasn't quite appropriate gating, but it was read as having an aortic root hematoma and uh, given her complicated history, she was transferred to our facility. We repeated the CT uh, and we saw a large anterior contained aortic root rupture with a pseudoaneurysm. And this was so large that there was compression of the distal aorta as well as the carina. So we initially consulted uh, cardiac surgery. A second redo sternotomy was felt to be too high risk for this patient who was already pretty ill, potentially with an active infection. And so they consulted us to see if we have any options for uh, percutaneous therapies. Chest x-ray mostly notable just for the widened mediastinum. And then a CT, this was at our facility, showed about a 12, 13 millimeter neck or so um, with a very large uh, pouch here full of, uh, where the pseudoaneurysm is. Also of note, the aorta was quite tortuous and so uh, we took that into account in procedural planning. A transthoracic echo here shows some flow communication into the large pseudoaneurysm. And just another picture of that, again right there. And so we had a big meeting to plan on how to approach this. Uh, it was felt we would be trying to close uh, a large contained root rupture with a pseudoaneurysm that had a relatively small os uh, via the transfemoral retrograde approach, noting that the aorta was quite torturous. And so both support and catheter lengths would be important to consider here uh, with the plan to approach the pseudoaneurysm caref carefully and then try to get a wire in there, deploy an occluder device, an ASD occluder device, potentially close it off look for interaction with the coronary ostea and do this all under uh, transesophageal and fluoroscopic guidance. Uh, I have a cine film at the end here, which shows this a little bit better, but you can kind of appreciate there's a large pseudoaneurysm there. And intraprocedural TEE with, you know, this echo is not great, but you can see there's some communication into the pseudoaneurysm there. We were able to get a wire into the neck, so this was very difficult. 12 French right femoral access uh, with a dry seal sheath. We ended up having to put in some long sheaths to aid our support. Lots of different catheters we, before we were able to get in there. Eventually, a seven French JR and a glide was used to approach the os. Switched that out for a super stiff wire that we pre-shaped to look 
uh, whatever we thought we could make it as big as possible. Uh, eventually tried to get in there with a torque view sheath and that wouldn't, it, it was too short. Uh, ended up getting a flexor shuttle sheath and having to kind of just push a lot before it, we finally were able to get the, all that in there. So it's a little bit of a puzzle. Some nice echo images with the super stiff wire in the pseudoaneurysm right here uh, at the bottom of the screen. And after just a little bit more work, we were able to deploy the ASD occluder device, which is in position here. Uh, before we uh, released it, we did have our sonographer take a peek. And there's some, just some nice images here of us pulling the device into place here. Do that once more. Uh, we did do an aortogram afterwards and showed that immediately the flow into the pseudoaneurysm was already decreased. And after deployment, we checked with color Doppler that also showed decreased flow. Still attached at this point, everything looked good. Uh, we did a quick coronary angiogram. It didn't look like there was any interaction with the coronaries. And so we released it, and this is a nice summary. So this is pre-deployment. You can see the flow into the pseudoaneurysm here. Wiring, this is a little bit better picture of just how large that pseudoaneurysm was. And then post-deployment, you can see the flow has decreased significantly. Go to the next slide here. We did get a CT post-op that already showed some thrombus forming and uh, it looked like the device was in good position. Just kind of a nice 3D image with the device in place. Uh, and so in summary, uh, we were able to get there after some difficulty navigating to the OS, but uh, with a, some equipment changes, we were able to get there. Deployed a 16 millimeter ASD clear device. The flow was decreased already uh, as soon as we deployed it and the coronaries did not look like they were obstructed. So a couple good learning points, obviously, there's not a ton of data on this just because it doesn't happen all that often. It is pretty uncommon with a high morbidity and mortality if you do try to approach it surgically. We were able to uh, get a nice result with the percutaneous approach. 2D and 3D TE echo with color Doppler played a key role in this, obviously. Uh, so great thank you to our imager, uh, Des J in this case. Uh, close follow-up is recommended. There is a case report that showed some recanalization up to three months post-deployment. So. Thank you to Dr. Siraj and Dr. Jay and Marcus and Linnell and our whole valve team. Thank you. That was great. Could you just comment on how you decided on the size of the ASD occluder? Uh, so on CT, it looked like it was about 13 millimeters. And uh, even with that, the C, we did have a CT that showed there was still some flow afterwards. But we just tried to get as big as possible in there to close it as best we could. Was there any concern about oversizing and rupturing? <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Uh, and we went into this, you know, we consented her and said, this is, you know, we're really at the kind of the bounds of our abilities here. She was okay with it. She just, she wanted everything we could possibly try. So fortunately, we had a good result. Thank you. All right, next speaker is um, Dr. Jezier. Yes. Um, Curious case of hypotension following transcatheter aortic valve replacement. All right. So this will be a case of a slightly different nature. Uh, let's see if I can bring it up here. <clears throat> My name is Ali Jazieri. I'm a cardiology fellow at University of Kansas. So this is a case of an 87-year-old lady who came to our clinic with fatigue and decreased exertional tolerance. Her main past medical history of note was coronary disease. She had had a cabbage in the remote past. Heart failure with a reduced DF of about 40%. Uh, peripheral arterial disease, previous AAA, aerodobiliac grafting, and a femfem bypass. Permanent AFib on warfarin and type 2 diabetes. Uh, her workup was revealing for uh, a very calcified uh, aortic valve with severe leaflet restriction, and she was ultimately diagnosed with low gradient severe AS. So after a hard team approach and appropriate conversations, she was ultimately referred for TAVR. And so this is the post-implant uh, shot after a 26 millimeter Evolute was implanted. Uh, overall, we were pretty satisfied with the positioning. But it was right about this time when she developed some hypotension. And immediately, it was right after the implant, and so with some transient vasopressor support, she seemed to do OK. Blood pressure came up but then started to decline again to about 60 millimeters of mercury systolic. The TEE was showing us hyperdynamic LV function, so we started to think about what other things could be going on. Tamponade, perforation, paravalvular leak, significant mitral regurge, perforation of the, of the aorta, 
uh, either ascending or descending, or perhaps something with vascular access. So we kind of went about systematically trying to look at these things. Meanwhile, while she was not doing very well, uh, mitral valve looked okay, mm -hmm. no significant effusion. We looked at the TAVR again, traced to mild paravalvular leak, but nothing major. We looked down low and couldn't really find much going on with the aorta at the level of the bifurcation, and then looked further down to our femoral access, and you can see the fem fem bypass there, and everything seemed to look okay. So we came back up and shot an ascending aortogram, and if you look closely here on the left side of the image, or the patient's right, you can see some blush there at the end of this clip. So we investigated that further with a subclavian angiogram, and this is what we found. So, as I had mentioned before, she had peripheral arterial disease. The left iliac was basically shut down. Uh, so for the uh, second uh, arterial access, we used a right radial approach. Uh, this was uh, performed using a stork wire. And on going up, we had noticed on floor that the wire had gone down into the rima, pulled it back, redirected it, got into the aorta, no issues. The patient was doing well throughout the procedure and really didn't have any hemodynamic compromise until right after the, the uh, valve was implanted or deployed. So at this point, we tried to tamponade it with a balloon. This is a 2.5 by 15 uh, Trek balloon, and uh, that didn't go so well. Still had some extravasation, uh, reversed heparin. And ultimately, we opted for a covered stent. Uh, so this is a GraphMaster 2.8 by 26, and you can still see some faint blush there adjacent to the stent. So we uh, post dilated this up to three millimeters. And with that, we felt like we had a good angiographic outcome. As far as the patient's clinical course, she was on vasopressors for a period of time, epi, phenylephrine. There was significant blood loss into the anterior mediastinum. Our TAVR cases are done with a surgeon and interventionalist uh, in the case, so the, our surgical colleague uh, felt that he should go ahead with drainage right away, so we did a peristernal thoracotomy in the hybrid room, drained about two and a half liters. And meanwhile, the patient received about four units of PRBCs. Chest tube removed post-op day six. Patient discharged day 12 to a skilled nursing facility. And then in follow-up at 12 months, her symptoms had improved to class two symptoms, trace para paravalvular regurgitation, and a mean gradient across the valve of about six millimeters of mercury. So what are the learning points of a case like this? Seemingly benign wire advancements, soft tip wires, good access, uh, can still produce complications. Vigilance is key. Maintaining a broad differential for hypotension following TAVR and looking at things systematically even though you may not have any doubts about specific uh, possibilities. And then just having the proper equipment and support to promptly treat and resolve the issue. In our case, we had the you know, covered stents available, the appropriate sizing, we were able to take care of it, and the patient thankfully did okay. Thank you. Question, did you guys say everything of putting a Vibon versus a graph master in the Rima, actually just placing a large Vibon across the subclavian? That um, was not was not considered, yeah. actually. Yeah. Just we had talked about bare metal stenting potentially, but then the ultimately decided about just to go on ahead with the graph master. Yeah. The question I have along those lines is did anybody think about coiling the Rima in that situation? Yeah, I mean that could definitely be an option as well. I think just with the expertise that were at hand. That was kind of the decision that we went with, but certainly also a viable option. And your patient had conscious sedation for the TAVR or? or uh, this was, uh, yeah, it was conscious sedation. It was conscious. She had no complaints? Well, uh, no, I mean, she, she was doing okay throughout the case. Nothing really to suggest that um, things weren't going our way up until after the valve was deployed. Yeah. Good. Okay, thank, you. All right. All right. thank you. All right, guys, so next will be Dr. Devanji with intractable heart failure after a coronal repair, a structural problem with a percutaneous solution. Thank you guys for joining me. I'd also like to thank the course directors and our moderators for this opportunity to present to you a case of intractable heart failure in a 24-year-old young man who presented with shortness of breath. 
So he immigrated from Mexico at a young age, at age 11, had pretty significant symptoms. They found a LV, congenital LVOT obstruction, and he underwent subaortic membrane resection. At age 15, he had conal repair, which invo involves a ventriculotomy, uh, aortotomy, and a bioprosthetic aortic valve, uh, and then a patch repair, a pericardial patch repair. He presents again eight years later with severe bioprosthetic aortic stenosis, has a 31 millimeter St. Jude bioleaflet prosthesis placed. Then he comes to our institution for the first time nine months later with signs and symptoms of heart failure. He also notes two months of progressive dyspnea and decreased exercise tolerance. He was previously, after his surgery, uh, fairly unlimited. On physical exam, you'll notice the wide pulse pressure with the blood pressure of 140 over 38. His heart rate was around 100. He was breathing quickly, but satting normally. His physical exam re revealed a mechanical S2, as you'd expect, a harsh three out of six to and fro murmur across the precordium, an elevated JVP, hepatomegaly with a palpable liver edge, and three plus lower extremity edema. His early clinical course in the hospitalization included medical management with IV diuretics and afterload reduction, but this didn't work so well. He had worsening liver function, lower extremity edema, and ascites. Further diuresis was subsequently hindered by hypotension and acute kidney injury, in addition to a rising lactate. Subsequently, we, initi we initiated inotropes, but again, with only minimal improvement. At this point, we really had to figure out why this young, young gentleman was having this pretty significant presentation of heart failure. This is his transthoracic echocardiogram at presentation, which revealed a well-functioning aortic valve prosthesis, mild LV dysfunction, and an enlarged RV. However, if you look closely, there was some suggestion of abnormal color flow here. This is a short axis view. Based on that, we proceed to, proceeded to transesophageal uh, echocardiogram, which again revealed a well-functioning bioprosthetic, or rather mechanical aortic valve. But uh, when color flow was added, we saw this abnormal flow from the ascending aorta into the right ventricular outflow tract. Here's some additional views of that. There also appears to be discontinuity in the wall there. We subsequently proceeded with cross-sectional imaging using CT angiography, which confirmed our suspicion that there was an ascending aorta to right ventricular outflow tract fistula. In the setting of this fistula, we did a diagnostic catheterization, which revealed markedly elevated right, right atrial, right ventricular, PA, and wedge pressures. Additionally, you'll notice the pretty significant step up in oxygenation between the RA and RV, uh, confirming the shunt, left to right shunt. Angiography revealed free flow of contrast from the ascending aorta to the RVOT, and we were able to cross through with a straight wire and a, uh, rather a Benson wire and the pigtail. So now we have a young man with right heart failure due to an ascending aorta to RVOT fistula. At this point, we had a multidisciplinary conference with our surgical colleagues, with a congenital uh, cardiologists, and came to the conclusion that in the setting of his three prior sternotomies, if it was at all possible, we should attempt a percutaneous solution for this fistula. Thus, with an amplat super stiff wire, we, we were able to cross the lesion. We did coronary angiography to confirm that we would not be interacting with any of his coronary arteries, and he, of course, had no significant coronary disease. Using a Tyshak balloon, we sized the lesion. We had some idea of the size from the CT angiogram as well. It was around 1.7 centimeters in diameter, or rather millimeters in diameter. So then we needed to dev decide which device we would use to close it. We considered a ductal occluder, but the largest size here, 1210, would have been too small for this lesion. Thus, we took a look at our vascular plex and decided that the AVP2 would be the appropriate size, a 20 millimeter AVP2, which is 16 millimeters in length. We thought that it would sit nicely in the defect, have stability in this highly mobile region, and do as little as possible to disrupt the aortic outflow and the uh, right ventricular outflow tract. Here's the device in position, still connected to the cable. You can see by angiography that there is no longer significant flow across the fistula. You'll see that there. We subsequently left the device in place for about 10 minutes to make sure that we fully imaged it, realizing that it has the potential to inter interact with that mechanical valve and to obstruct flow out of the right ventricular outflow tract. We did significant uh, transesophageal echocardiography to make sure that that was not the case. And you can see here that there's really minimal color flow across the fistula. Satisfied that it was in a reasonably safe and stable position, we then deployed the device 
in the fistula, and you can see its position there. Again, we remained for about 15 minutes looking at the device very carefully to make sure that it did not move and it did not disrupt any associated structures. You can see the 3D TEE on the right and the color images on the left. No significant flow across the device. It's well seated, it's stable, and it remains stable. I'll remind you of the hemodynamics before uh, the fistula was closed. After we closed it, we saw a significant reduction in his RV and PA pressures, and importantly, a significant reduction in the shunt fraction. He was weaned off of inotropic support quickly. He subsequently had brisk diuresis and improvement in his organ function. He symptomatically improved as well as walking around the hospital two days later, and he was discharged home in stable condition four days later. He followed up two weeks and then three months later in stable condition with improved exercise tolerance and no evidence on echo of aortic or pulmonic stenosis or any disruption of the outflow tracts. Additionally, on 3D CT imaging, the device was in stable position, had not moved. So aortic RVOT fistulae are quite rare. They can occur in the setting of endocarditis, of, in the setting of patch repair, in the setting of surgical aortic valve replacement, and there's a case report of it happening in the setting of a TAVR as well. In our case, it likely resulted from partial dehiscence of the previous pericardial patch that was used the, in the original Kono repair. And in the setting of the severe bioprosthetic aortic stenosis, which, as you know, would result in a uh, high velocity, low pressure flow in the immediate post stenotic area, this may have been masked. Looking back at his old surgical reports, there was a brief mention of a potential fistula there, but it was not closed because it was thought at that time to be hemodynamically insignificant. In the setting of the relief of this obstruction when he got a new aortic valve and had higher flow across the, uh, across the aorta. The pressure likely increased. There was an increase in the ascending aorta to RVOT gradient, and thus this allowed increased shunting. In that setting, the fistula became clinically manifest and had a greater impact on the RV. Echocardiography, cross-sectional imaging, and catheterization really allowed us to fully understand this defect. And in this case, a transcatheter approach was feasible, safe, and effective in terms of reducing his symptoms and getting him out of the hospital. And considering his significant perioperative risk, we feel was the appropriate approach. With that in mind, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, I got a question. So you, you um, can you describe this defect a little better for us? I think you told us the size, the diameter of the defect. Did it have some length to it? You chose a device that's more of a vascular plug? Yeah, it was, uh, it was not fully circular, it was ovoid, but it was on CT uh, 1.8 by 1.6. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we took the Tyshak balloon, we got numbers that were very similar. And because the concern was that this was dehiscence of the previous pericardial patch repair, we felt that this circular device would fit quite well without disrupting anything else. And do you think that your device, your AVP2, uh, protruded either in or out of the, the two structures there? Did you think about doing more of a pancake type thing with uh, an ASO? We uh, thought about it, uh, but once it, it relates to two things. One is uh, operator expertise, I guess. And the second is that we felt that the lesion was long enough that uh, it wouldn't disrupt the structures. And thankfully, it didn't. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker is uh, Dr. Kellogg. Um, if you hear hoofbeats, think horses. Remember deadly zebras. <laughs> nice, nice title. Thank you. Thanks. Um, let's see. So my name is Dean Kellogg. I'm an internal medicine resident from San Antonio. Um, and just spoiler, <laughs> I don't know. I snuck in. I, <laughs> um, so spoiler alert, I don't have cath lab experience. I don't have an eloquent like structural intervention that we've just heard about. Um, so I'll do my best not put you to sleep for the next five minutes, um, maybe do some board review. So um, this patient, a 60 year old gentleman, he has a history of HEFPEF um, and refractory AFib. He ended up getting referred to our hospital with a worsening CHF, now class three symptoms. They thought it was due to a, a PFO from an ablation he had had three months prior. Um, as, a, as an outpatient, he uh, really didn't have any other um, history. He, there was a, some, he reported having a history of uh, 
hypertension, so Chad Basque of two was uh, anticoagulated. Um, on exam, he was normal tensive, but he had really profound right and left sided CHF symptoms. Um, JVD, S4, ascites, um, lower extremity edema up to his sacrum. Um, and really, n the labs, um, no proteinuria, normal creatinine, um, significantly elevated BMP. His EKG uh, was a normal sinus, um, inferior Q waves with some right ventricular hypertrophy um, and low voltage. Uh, <coughs> uh, on echo, he had a preserved EF, um, severe diastolic grade three dysfunction um, with uh, ED ratios in the 29 and 21, um, grade three diastolic dysfunction, um, severe LVH, enlarged RV that you can see here. Um, and an elevated pulmonary artery systolic pressure. So just another view of the left ventricular hypertrophy. And then this was the culprit PFO that he was referred to, um, to us for. And it really was not very impressive. It's a small, not very high velocities. There's another view of it. He did get a, a cath out from an outside institution, um, which showed some, confirmed the pulmonary hypertension. It was probably WHO class two with an LVEDP of 23 and no significant coronary artery disease. So we admitted him uh, for a heart failure exacerbation, diuresed him, but really ran into problems with symptomatic hypotension, um, inadequate urine output, and it just keep, kept getting worse. So we kind of questioned this like PFO causing his, hype, his uh, refractory uh, heart failure and broadened our differential um, to some of these other things. And the, the one that really stuck out for me, and the, what we ended up working up was amyloidosis. So we did that with a cardiac MRI um, that showed diffuse gadolinium enhancement um, characteristic of amyloid. And then his hematologic workup kind of confirmed that um, with bone marrow biopsies um, and an amino, <coughs> amino <coughs> fixation. Um, so this is the, the final diagnosis. Um, I think some of the challenges we faced were anchoring bias. We just kind of went with what we were told. Um, it's also pretty rare for amyloidosis to present just like with pretty much isolated cardiac symptoms. Um, and it, we definitely ran into a lot of problems with uh, the diuresis along the way. So just some board review. Um, Think about amyloidosis whenever you have an unexplained heart failure, and early diagnosis and treatment is really important. Um, once CHF symptoms start, the 50% um, or the median survival is six months without treatment, and that goes up to 47 months with treatment. Um, and these are some of the other classic buzzwords for um, amyloidosis. Low voltage EKGs, like we saw with the pseudo infarct pattern. Um, classically, it presents with nephrotic syndrome and peripheral neuropathy, which we didn't see in this case and made it more difficult. Um, don't treat them with ACE inhibitors or beta blockers. The calcium channel blockers are contraindicated because it can deposit along the amyloid fibrils. And regardless of the CHADS VASC, anticoagulation is indicated because uh, on autopsy, there are up to 50% of patients with amyloid have intracardiac thrombus. And then really quickly getting to chemotherapy is important for prognosis. Thank you. Just one question. Um, very nice presentation. And I'm Thanks. very impressed that at your level of detail, especially given that you're not even in cardiology training. <laughs> so that's very impressive. Um, uh, I think you guys were, were spot on to <clears throat> the chance that the iatrogenic small ASD that was created following the pulmonary reinitialization is very unlikely to be the cause. One thing to keep in mind on the differential for anybody who's had a previous um, AFib ablation is always think about pulmonary vein stenosis too. That, that's something that should be considered on the differential, although probably not with over heart failure symptoms like you guys saw. Thank you. All right, guys, next will be bilateral transradial aortic, aortic balloon valvuloplasty for severe symptomatic aortic stenosis by Dr. Kabak. Thank you. 
All right, uh, thank you all for having me over here. My name is Amjad Kabash. I'm a third year cardiology fellow at Creighton University from Omaha, Nebraska. And this is a couple of my co-fellows and uh, our staff that we did the, the procedure with. So this case is about 55-year-old female who have morbid obesity. Her BMI is around 80, uh, which was diagnosed with uh, severe aortic stenosis. And she actually presented with refractory heart failure, multiple admissions despite medical therapy, you just keep diuresing her and just, just keep failing and come over even despite all the maximum therapy that we could provide her. And just about her social uh, history, she's also wheelchair bound. She lives in a community of, uh, uh, with the resident with disability. She does not, she's not really active. Uh, she has severe arthritis and she's not able to ambulate with severe pain and not much of uh, family support. So her echocardiogram, which did show severe aortic stenosis, mild aortic regurgitation. The mean gradient was around like 47, uh, peak velocity four a meter, which is uh, also cons all of this consistent with severe aortic stenosis and it's possibly bicuspid uh, based on the uh, uh, echocardiogram. And this is the uh, uh, echo. So this short, uh, this is long axis parasternal view. You can see a look at the aortic valve, heavy calcified, some mild, mild, uh, mild aortic regurgitation also. You can see very d difficult pictures uh, to get with her uh, morbid obesity. This is uh, the I mean gradient and also the Vmax, as we mentioned, uh, they're consistent with the severe aortic stenosis. Also with the continuity equation, you can look at the aortic valve area. So at this point, because of this frequent hospitalization with heart failure, obviously the reason that we found that is, is this uh, severe aortic stenosis. So cardiovas cardiovascular surgery was consulted and was a discussion between a heart team about what's the best approach to consider. And they were turning turn her down because of her morbid obesity and that uh, they consider her as a uh, poor, uh, poor candidate for rehabilitation after the surgery and really, really concerned about if she's gonna be able to be extubated after the uh, uh, um, uh, sur surgical valve replacement. Also we approached the structural team about possible tavern and at this point she was really sick and uh, they were not really sure if it's the first thing they want to provide her at this point and a discussion about what's the best approach to consider and this is what we're going to present today. So how we can approach this for now. So we decided to do bilateral transradial valvuloplasty. As mentioned, she's morbidly obese. Femoral axis is one of the options that is usually the tradition that we usually do, but was really difficult in, her, in this case, have, having been that she's morbid obese. So what we did, we did a right uh, arterial cannulation with a six French and then uh, also the right, or the left radial six, six French. Initially some, some spasm treated with some nitro, which worked very well. And also we did right brachial vein uh, cannulation was uh, uh, six French uh, also, and uh, we with a baser wire. I'm gonna look at the case next. So, um, past two wires, uh, 0.8 steel core, uh, to both both placed uh, into the LV from both of the uh, from the uh, trans uh, radial arteries, and uh, across the aortic valve, and two peripheral balloons measured to uh, the 12 millimeter were uh, simultaneously inflated on uh, at the same time at, in the aortic valve. Uh, while we're, we're basing her heart at 180 uh, uh, beat per minute. Also, we did measurement uh, afterwards with a swan through the brachial vein, and which measured that the uh, uh, gradient was 35. The descending aorta, which uh, orthogram, which did show also mild uh, aortic insufficiency. And this is the, uh, the actual procedure. So, so you can see the. Uh, a trans, uh, 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 the basing coming from the uh, radial, uh, the, from the brachial vein, both wires uh, crossing from the trans radial arteries. Um, and uh, you can look at the balloons uh, 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 around like the word aortic valve area, which they're gonna be inflated simultaneously at this time. And during inflation, you can look at the waste that usually happened because of the, uh, at the aortic valve. And we had to inflate twice uh, to able to uh, have, a, have a good results. Uh, uh, to inflate the both balloons at the same time uh, inflated. No major, no major complication and uh, orthogram done right afterwards which, which didn't show any significant AI after the procedure. And uh, uh, so uh, was successful aortic valvuloplasty through the bilateral radial arteries and the gradient went down from 45 to 35 mercury with no change in the aortic insufficiency uh, after the procedure. And this is an echocardiogram, which done, done on follow-up, not on the same day after the procedure, uh, which you can see the aortic valve still heavily calcified. Uh, um, not, 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 no significant AI was noted on the, uh, on the echocardiogram. 
Uh, however, we'll look at the numbers. And the numbers went down a little bit, as I mentioned, like uh, Vmax is 3.8, which is still, still uh, like in the elevated. The continuity equation is still like uh, severe aortic stenosis, and uh, the gradient is still, uh, still high. So, however, she was discharged. She followed in the clinic uh, in a couple, in couple of months, no hospitalization. So at least temporary, she was uh, uh, in better shape. And the, the, the goal is to uh, have maybe some rehabilitation and maybe down the road is a tougher procedure uh, when she's able to uh, maybe lose some weight and better rehabilitation episode. Have another case, also we did the, the kind of similar uh, story. Uh, just have video for this case, so severely calcified aortic valve as you look over here. And basically similar story, mor morbidly obese uh, patient, uh, really difficult access. Uh, the same, same maneuver, uh, uh, tra bilateral transradial uh, cannulation and uh, 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 valvuloplasty uh, by, by two peripheral balloons which measure 12 by 12. Uh, well, in this case, the patient did okay, but however, long term, she didn't uh, do well. She ended up going to hospice uh, from the heart significant heart failure. And uh, symptoms also were to go. So the point that we're trying to, I'm trying to say today is bilateral access, uh, bilateral radial access is a feasible access. It's safe, effective, and this, in this difficult cases that we encounter, uh, um, um, Hopefully, as a transition, maybe to a TAVR or some other other uh, final uh, treatment for the severe aortic stenosis. Thank you. Any questions? So, one quick question: Did you actually uh, consider when you were saying the femorals? Was it mostly because their obesity didn't access the femorals, or was it poor? P was it just PAD? It's a, a kind of combination. Was poor uh, peripheral, uh, poor peripheral pulse PAD, and uh, uh, there were some also uh, some infection in the area in the groin. So we felt that uh, maybe the uh, radial artery would be much easier and maybe more safer. We're also concerned about post complicate if any there is complication afterwards, bleeding could be a little bit difficult and uh, 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 protecting the uh, femoral axis after after the procedure. And you paste for both uh, BEVs? You're using rabbit pacing? Rabbit pacing, yep. Okay. And this both were through the uh, brachial vein uh, axis. Some people use uh, also can use IJ, IJ if we need to. How did you decide on your balloon size? Balloon size. So this is uh, uh, so it, I think the usual uh, balloon that we, we use is around like 20. So that we got like 12, 12. Uh, um, there were uh, there were a case that we we found in li the literature also mentioned similar uh, uh, approach. So we we kind of. Uh, followed that, that uh, case uh, and the, and the sizing of the balloons. But basically because it's 12-12, this is what we felt as a good option. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, next speaker is uh, Dr. Branca. Coming full circle, a case of replacing regurgitant valve with a stenotic one. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sagar Ranka. I'm a third year medical intermedicine resident in Cook County Hospital of Chicago. And today I'm presenting an interesting case that I've seen in the, I've been following in the clinic for the last two years. And the sequence of events spans over the last five years. Uh, unfortunately, I have no disclosures. Uh, so 37-year-old Hispanic lady, she was seen in the cardiology clinic for a new onset of exertional angina that has been going on for the last uh, one year. She denied uh, exertional dyspnea, no angina, no orthopnea, no heart failure symptoms. Blood pressure was 102 by 63. Heart rate was in the 60s. Exam showed normal S1, S2, uh, grade 3 pansystolic murmur in the mitral area. Otherwise, the uh, rest of the examination was uh, completely normal. This is her EKG. It shows normal sinus rhythm, nothing exciting here. Uh, so we pursue with a basic TTE which showed rheumatic mitral valve with restricted, restriction of the posterior mitral leaflet with severe MR. No stenosis was seen. Uh, the LV size was normal. The LV function was normal, 65% EF. Uh, pulmonary artery systolic pressure was 35. Uh, because of these findings, a TE was pursued to further characterize uh, uh, the mitral valve pathology, which showed the same thing as uh, the posteriorly, posteriorly directed uh, eccentric regurgitant jet. Other, all other valves were normal and LA was dilated. So the diagnosis at this point of time was chronic stage T primary MR. So 
you went through the management as recommended by ESC and ACC guideline where mitral valve repair is a class 1B recommendation in patients uh, having severe primary MR, especially uh, posterior valve pathology, posterior leaflet pathology, my bad. Uh, so bearing in mind that this patient had rheumatic valve disease, rheumatic valve replacement would have been uh, like the first choice, uh, but Interoperatively, the surgeon found that the mitral valve was minimally affected by the rheumatic process. There was P2, P3 fusion. Um, there was a cleft between the P2, P3 scallops, which was then repaired, and there was a 25 mm Duran annuloplasty ring placed. Uh, just to go by what the guidelines recommend in perspective of this, the mitral valve repair in rheumatic valve disease is a class 2B indication, especially where you there is minimal rheumatic valve disease and um, you can you can be sure that you get a durable mitral valve repair. So at eight, so postoperatively she did well, no symptoms. At eight months, she did mention of exertional uh, sh shortness of breath. The repeat ET already was showing some physiological stenosis. The mitral valve gradient at this time was eight millimeters of mercury at heart rate of 99. Uh, we optimized her medical therapy, increased the beta blockers. Uh, and after subsequently she was, uh, she felt better, continued to follow up with us. At three years, she now mentioned of an uh, NYHA class three exertional shortness of breath, as well as feels like somebody is sitting on her chest for the last three to four months. At this time, given this patient's previous surgical history, our main differential diagnosis was, was there a, fa was there a failure of the annuloplasty ring, which could have resulted in a new MR and that's causing her symptoms? Is there a rupture of the caudate tendony? Uh, bearing in mind that this patient did not have any caudate tendony repair, um, aortic valve disease, new onset, or any other non-cardiac conditions. Something that we did not think of initially was worsening of the physiological mitral stenosis right away of, uh, because of the annuloplasty ring that was placed. So we went ahead and got a um, transthoracic echo which showed a mitral valve gradient of 12 at the heart rate of 60, and mitral valve area already looked very stenotic at 1.2 at this time. The annual ring was normal in size and in motion. Stress TT was pursued just to get more uh, uh, information about her exercise tolerance. She could only walk for three minutes. Um, the gradient was 33 at heart rate of 100 to 104. The peak pre PA pressures at this time were already 75. So this time now, the patient now has severe symptoms and uh, has markedly abnormal hemodynamics. Uh, almost two, three to four years after her annuloplasty ring. So we referred her again for a surgical uh, uh, opinion and she underwent a reduced anatomy with the removal of the ring and replacement of a 27 millimeters mechanical mitral valve. And as we had suspected, the surgeon during the intraoperative um, uh, course saw that there was panis formation and scar formation which could have resulted in the stenosis. She's currently at 18 months follow-up, she's doing well. Um, so take home points, patient prosthesis mismatch, which is usually described in context of valve replacement, is also been described in, in context of annuloplasty rings. Patients, especially Hispanic patients with lower body surface area, are at increased risk, especially because of placement of smaller uh, annuloplasty ring, typically 26 to 28. Post-surgical functional stenosis is uh, important because but per the guidelines, we are doing more mitral valve repair, even in asymptomatic patients with abnormal hemodynamics. And so to go back, to look back and see what could we have done and caught this earlier was that surveillance of patients at least one year out from the annuloplasty repair uh, should, be, uh, should be done. And at that time, if the echo shows elevated mean mitral gradients, then these patients should be closely monitored for having patient prosthesis mismatch. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yeah, well, what did you think about that ring when you first saw your, the case, that 25 millimeter ring? So it was uh, before I started residency back in 2011. So like, it sounds pretty big. Uh, the 20, I didn't actually know the sizes yeah. initially. Yeah. So it was... Um, very small, huh, for a that, mitral. Yeah. That's why, I, like, later on I realized what sizes they go from. Like, the lowest is, I think, 25. So she was here, just had the 26. As, yeah, so. Good. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good.
All right, guys. So uh, next speaker, Dr. Ganesh Athapan, coming from my old stomping grounds, a challenging case of bicuspid aortic valve stenosis treated by TAPR. Good afternoon. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the uh, organizers that give me, uh, give me this opportunity to present this case. So, you know, in the interest of time, let me just start with the case here. I have no disclosures. Oh, is that? Let me. Okay. So, this is actually actually a very common case, but it was just a lot, uh, uh, you know, very challenging. So, so a 70-year-old male with severe aortic stenosis, functional class four dyspnea on exertion, and CHF. His comorbidities included coronary disease, status post cabbage in 2002. He had a parent lima to the LED, a cephalus ring graft to the RCA, and a cephalus ring graft to the OM. Ascending, as, uh, ascending aortic aneurysm, uh, size of which was five, uh, five centimeters, COPD, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. His STS turns out to be just four if you just take into uh, account aortic valve replacement. But uh, you know, if you take into account the uh, spry cabbage, and if you take into account that he needed an aortic root uh, repair, uh, that increased the, I mean, you know, uh, the mortality. So none of the local surgeons uh, in our hospital, none of the surgeons in our hospital, all the local surgeons wanted to operate on him. So he was uh, sent over to me for, um, for, for, for consideration of tablet. Look at his echo. His echo is a bicuspid aortic valve. It's a, it's a type zero with orientation of the free edges of the cusping anterior and posterior. The valve area was 0.7, mean grain of 57, peak grain of 100, and EF of 65. The CTA data showed the, uh, showed the maximum ascending aortic diameter of, of five uh, centimeters, sinus of valve cell width of 60 millimeters, sinus height of 43.8, STG width 40.9. And the annulus, the, these are the measurements of the annulus, 23.6 times 26.4 millimeters, perimeter 80.3, area 499.7 millimeters square. You know, so uh, this is just a representative image, CT image showing a bicuspid valve, the one, uh, the third one, um, you know, the, the lower left one showing a bicuspid C was zero type. These other images showing heavily calcified iodic valve and the bicuspid nature. Uh, you know, we, we looked at the transfemoral axis, everything looked good, both sides were feasible. And we thought it was gonna be a routine case, a routine bicuspid, uh, routine bicuspid case. Uh, before I went into the case, I didn't appreciate the, um, uh, the tortuosity. If you look here, uh, you know, you, I, I, I picked the right femoral. The right actually goes, it, it goes to the left, and then it again makes another turn to the, le uh, to the right, and then starts making another turn to the left, and then takes this, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, another curve like a roller coaster coming down on the calcified aortic valve. This is again showing just the tortuosities in, in, the, uh, in the aorta there. So uh, start, start off in standard fashion, got a big tail and non-coronary cusp, uh, you know, I took a root picture, which basically just, uh, you know, showed um, the civilly calcified valve. I, I crossed again, standard fashion with a, uh, with a straight wire, but once I crossed, I, I was unable to advance an AL1, or for that matter, any catheter across the valve, even one of a very small crossing profile. The problem seemed to be a combination of the civilly calcified small aortic valve opening with a dilated and horizontal aorta, which prohibited a good backup for our pushing maneuvers. So, you know, at, at this point I had my AL1, which was, uh, you know, I just had the tip of the AL1 across the valve, and I said, you know, I'm not able to get it across, let me just put a stiffer wire, maybe that, that's gonna change, the, change it. So I somehow stuffed the safari wire in, that's not the best thing to do, but I pushed it in um, and got that. But that didn't change anything. And then I actually at some point switched to Lundquist, and this is what was happening. So each time I pushed anything, you can see, I mean, each, uh, when I push, it all goes down in the sinus. I'm pushing the sinus. Uh, the forces are all, uh, uh, they're not into the valve, and my wire just keeps prolapsing out of the LV. So uh, in order to overcome this challenge, I, I thought maybe, you know, putting a second stiff wire into the LV and using um, maybe, uh, maybe an option. So I tried that, but I couldn't cross. Uh, I couldn't uh, put on the, uh, you know, I couldn't cross with this, uh, with one wire in the LB. So he said, okay, let's just switch out. Try this, I mean, recross again. Maybe there's a different uh, channel we can go through. Didn't help either. 
So I said, okay, let's leave a buddy wire uh, with a second big tail, uh, you know, uh, just in the uh, cusp and see if that straighten, straightens it out. But, you know, it was uh, same, same result. Everything kept prolapsing out. So at this point, I was unable to advance valvoplasty balloon across the valve, despite using, you know, uh, whatever techniques you know of, uh, the, also using the stiff uh, Lundquist wire. As a, lot, uh, as a last resort, I, I decided that I, I'd use an, uh, you know, a 10 by 40 Mustang peripheral angioplasty balloon, <coughs> which I'd advanced with great dis difficulty, despite its small profile, as you all know. Um, and I performed uh, balloon valvoplasty. So this is, the, uh, this is the Mustang balloon going up. You can see there's a clear waist there. It, it looked more like I was doing a coronary, uh, you know, I was actually doing a, a pre dilatation of coronary artery. So once I was able to, once I did the uh, dilatation of the Mustang, I proceeded to do valvoplasty with a tie shack balloon. And it, uh, somehow got the tie shack in, but the 20 millimeter tie shack ruptured. The amount of the calcification so much that it ruptured. So, like, so then got a 24 millimeter tie shack, inflated that, you know, and at this point I thought I had good result and I was, I was going to be, uh, I thought everything was going to go fine after this. So, but despite adequate valvoplasty, prolonged maneuvers with the guide wire, it was not possible to advance the core valve prosthesis across the NATO uh, IDEC valve. Extremely heavy calcification NATO valve, unfavorable IDEC angulation, small LV cavity, dilated iota, and IDEC tortuosity caused the system to hang up on the IDEC wall. So this is what you can see. Uh, so um, I have the core valve there, but this is where the valve is and my uh, valve doesn't want to uh, advance further than this because each time I push, I'm either pushing it up, uh, pushing sideways, upwards, and I'm just pushing the wall, and my wire keeps flopping out. And this is just uh, showing you the tortuosities which didn't straighten out with the, uh, with the Lundquist. And again, these are the angulations I'm facing uh, when I'm doing this. So, you know, but at the end, after all the balloon valvoplasty, I was able to put a pigtail in, which was the first time I ever able to get a catheter in, in into the LV. So, um, uh, once I had that, I, I started looking at what my options were. I said, okay, maybe, maybe a subclavian axis, but looking at this, uh, then I looked, so I said, maybe you switch to a uh, subclavian axis, but I didn't think that I was going to get, you know, changing to a left or right subclavian would, would provide any uh, addition to ability to force or push the core valve. A direct transcytic approach would definitely uh, be, be better. It would mean general anesthesia and added surgical invasiveness. So, you know, at, at that point, I opted to switch out and, uh, and say, you know, let's try, the, uh, I think the Edwards, um, uh, switch the Edwards Sapien platform, use the flexibility option of the commander delivery system. Um, you know, in my lab, we don't have flexibility of just switching valves from the core valve to Edwards. You need the rep in, so I had to stop the case, uh, you know, bring the patient in in two weeks. Uh, so I brought him back in two weeks. You know, again, same difficulty, but I was somehow able to um, use, the, um, you know, use the delivery system of the Edwards valve and get this across. You know, it was tough, but we were able to get it across, and then we went ahead and, you know, um, then standard fashion deployed the valve. It does come out a little bit, but it looks, uh, you know, the, uh, other images which show that it was. Um. So at the end, we had some, uh, you know, we had some mild PBL. Um, looked at the echoes, they were just uh, mild, and there were the moderate range, so we left them alone. Um. So, uh, you know, I've seen him fall up in, in three months. He's, he's been doing good. So, inability to cross the synodic attic valve with a valvoplasty balloon in the setting of transfemoral TAVI, although extremely rare, leads to immediate procedural failure and or change to more aggressive approach. The menu was described in our case. It's use of a stiff wire, use of peripheral arterial balloon, serial dilation, and switching delivery platforms can provide solution to this rare hindrance. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Uh, I saw that you're having trouble, obviously, looking at horizontal deployments. Uh, the torture here. Did you put a 20 French long sheath in to deliver the core valve in, or did you go in line only? No, no. We had the sheath in. We, uh, as soon as I saw the torture, I decided uh, this, this was not an inline case because uh, I put a sheath in. And even with the sheath in, it was, uh, and I actually lost access. I mean, inside, 
It was just flopping out of the LV each time you try to do anything. Yeah, it looks like you, you couldn't even get your nose cone on the valve, right? No, so nothing. I mean, the nose cone was just hitting the wall, and each time push, it was just going to the sinus. The sinus was so big. At the end of the case, I usually always, after I finish my case, I do a, a completion, hem uh, uh, you know, I look at the hemodynamics. Each time I tried, I, I couldn't get anything that bad. Each time I just wanted to go into the sinus. No. That's how big the sinus was. We use, we use both valve platforms in our lab, and um, you know, intuitively, I feel like the, the Medtronic valve tracks better, but for, for patients with like three-dimensional aortic tortuosity up in, the, up, in the, up in the arch, I feel like you're, you're fighting yourself with different forces in different directions. Once you make one curve, then you're biasing the other way. So we've switched completely for this type of situation. We would, we would go straight with Edward's head, given, given a few experiences like this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys feel transaxillary would have been more advantageous than going. Yeah. Because you're just avoiding, you know, I know what you're saying initially, yeah. not being on, you know, The horizontal route was what I, yeah. It's a shorter, I mean, if it's not a sedation, you don't want to convert at that point. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the Edwards, uh, if, if, uh, if I'd start off with Edwards, I'm not sure if I would be able, because I couldn't get a balloon initially. But I think once you got the balloon in, uh, the Edwards yeah. was the way to go. The, the I, think the, I think the serial balloon inflation, starting really small, was, was a very yeah. smart way to go. Yeah. So did you try Innova wire? That might have you the Innova, I think it's, it's pretty similar to the Safari wire. Safari. Yeah, it's, it, uh, the Safari wasn't giving me enough support there. And, and, you know, I had the Lundequist after that. Even that wasn't giving any support there. The wire would just flop out of the, because the forces were such that you were, when you were pushing, you were pushing to the side, and then you were pushing up into the arch, and then the other one was, uh, you know, to the side of the sinus. Okay. So yeah. the Safari wire, you can deep seal it quite a bit so that you have a I, um, I can show you some images where the wire is deep seated, and we looked at that. We looked on echo, I mentioned it was in the apex, but you push, everything just comes out. It's, it's like there's just no, <laughs> no support there.